السلام عليك يا رسول الله حبيب الله السلام عليك يا رسول الله حبيب الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته to all the viewers welcome back to British Muslim TV you're watching Sira live from the Wakefield studio with myself Imam Muhammad Abu Bakr Salim you can watch live on Sky 752 Facebook or Twitter at British Muslim TV as always if you have any questions or comments on the topic of Sira please do get in touch and messages on WhatsApp on the number on your screen 07585835150 now before we begin last week we left our viewers once again with two questions and asked you guys to message in the answers so the first question was that in whose house did the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam stay in central Medina? So when the Prophet Sallallahu arrived into Medina, where did the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam stay? So the correct answer to that is he stayed in the house of Abu Ayyub Ansari. And the second question we left our viewers with was that after the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, who was the first person to extend Masjid Nabawi. So in the time of the Prophet, the Masjid Nabawi was built, but the extension that happened, the first ever extension that happened, who was the first person to do that? And the correct answer to that is the first person was Hazrat Umar radiallahu ta'ala an. So last week we continued with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam's arrival in central Medina and how the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam's camel through divine intervention, chose the spot that Masjid al-Nabawi would be built and where the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa would reside. We then looked at the construction of the masjid and how it has actually expanded over the years uh, as to how we see it today when we go to visit in uh, Medina, Saudi Arabia. And finally, we were narrating the story of the tree trunk that served as a sort of member for the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So as we were saying, initially the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he used one of the tree trunks to lean on whilst he would deliver his sermons, right? A few years later, at the request of an Ansari woman, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam allowed a carpenter to make a proper member. So the carpenter made a member of three steps similar to how we see the majority today. Now, during the first khutbah that the Prophet gave on this new member, right, as we are saying, that uh, th this new member, member, it was placed further away from the tree trunk, trunk that the Prophet initially used. So the Prophet is giving his first ever khutbah on that newly made member with the three steps. The Sahaba narrate that they began to hear a kind of wailing or crying sound, like a bit similar to like a baby camel, right? And then they say that we found that the source of the noise was the tree, subhanAllah. So the, the, everyone can hear this crying sound. And the Prophet Sallallahu he could hear this as well. The Prophet Sallallahu he stopped his khutbah, right? He immediately stopped his khutbah he came off the member and walked towards that tree trunk. The Prophet ﷺ goes up to the tree trunk and he places his hand on the, on the trunk. You know, like a person would do to quieten a child. So like that, he placed his hand on that tree trunk. And some narrations actually mention the Prophet ﷺ hugged it. Right? So the Sahaba, they say that as the Prophet ﷺ put his hand or hugged the tree trunk, they heard the tree trunk sniffle and after that, he stopped crying. So as I was saying that this was a miracle that Allah allowed the Sahaba, the companions, to hear the emotions of the tree. And in fact, afterwards, the Prophet himself then said to the Sahaba that if I hadn't hugged this tree trunk, it would have cried until the day of judgment, subhanAllah. Right? So obviously, this tree, it was upset that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had left it for another member, right? So this probably sounds strange for some of us, right? But, but through this miracle, this 
tree delivered a message to mankind. It was distressed at being far from the Prophet wasallam, and it was alarmed at being parted from the Prophet wasallam, And it wished that the nearness that, he, that this tree trunk had with the Prophet wasallam, this trunk wished that it never ended. Its wish was that the Prophet always was to use it to lean on to do his, to do his khutbah, right? So this tree trunk, it's as if through this story, it's as if it was declaring to us that we should seek that delight which comes from following the guidance of the Prophet wasallam and adhering to his sunnah, right? This tree trunk is telling us that we should feel distressed at being far from the sunnah, that we should be aware of transgressing in the sunnah, that we should hold fast, subhanAllah, to the sunnah and cling to it with our lives. So why in order that we might attain closeness to the Prophet Sallallahu in the hereafter, Allahu Akbar. Right? In fact, even Hassan Basri, rahimahullah, when he would say to his, uh, he, he, when he used to narrate this story to his students, he would say to them that, look, O oh believers, O oh you who believe in Allah and his messenger, look that this was a tree that was crying because it wished to be with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Is it not more befitting that those of us who are men and women, those of us who are human, we should cry even more to be close to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He always used to give this, he always used to say this and question his students whenever he would narrate this, uh, uh, this hadith. So this is the message that this tree trunk gave us, subhanAllah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it easy for us to follow in the footsteps of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Now, the reward for praying in Masjid al-Nabawi, a narration in Bukhari mentions, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says that a prayer in this mosque of mine, i.e. Masjid al-Nabawi, is a thousand times greater than a prayer in any other mosque, except for Masjid al-Haram, subhanAllah a thousand times greater than a prayer in any other mosque except for Masjid al-Haram. Subhanallah, such a great reward for praying in Masjid al-Nabi. And that is why we should try to visit these holy masjids as much as possible. And when we are in the holy cities, to pray as many salah as possible in these masjids rather than the other local masjids. Now, you see, this whole incident of the Prophet ﷺ traveling to Medina, stopping in Kuba, building a masjid, coming into central Medina, building a masjid. So after leaving Mecca, twice the Prophet ﷺ gave preference to the building of a masjid over his own house and accommodation. In Kuba, the first task was building a masjid. Now in central Medina, the first task again is building a masjid, right? It just shows us the status of the masjid, right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala literally calls masjid his houses and he praises them in the Quran, right? And, and the Prophet even says in the Quran as well, uh, in, a, in a hadith, that the most beloved places in the eyes of Allah are the masajid, right? You see, the, the, the masajid, they're not just places where you go to read your salah, right? That's the difference between the masjid that was in the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the masjid that we have today. Is that in the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they were not just places where you go to read your salah. In fact, the masjid, it was a place of shura. It was a place where people would con uh, do consultations. The masjid was the madrasa and the university. The masjid was the place where people decide their affairs and socialize. The masjid was the place for celebration through nikahs and other, uh, other celebrations, Eid, etc. And the masjid was the accommodation for those who had no roof and who had no homes. The masjid was where the Muslims were governed from. Right? So the masjid wasn't simply a place where people would go pray and that's it done. The masjid was the central hub of the entire town or city. Right? And this is how the ideal masjid should be. So those of us that are managing masjids, we should aim to make our masjids as well in today's uh, day as much as, uh, as much as we can to how they were in the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And it was only 
after the masajid were built that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam turned his attention towards his own house. Subhanallah. Now, at the time when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa migrated to Medina, uh, by the time the whole masjid was built, etc. At the time, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had two wives. Sauda radiallahu ta'ala anha and Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha. So both of their houses were built next to the masjid. And these were actually the only two houses of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that were connected directly to the masjid. Because the other wives that the Prophet had were married later on uh, in the years. And by that time, other people had already built their houses around the masjid. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, other wives' houses, they didn't have direct entrances to the masjid. Right? Now, although there were two houses of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that were connected directly to the masjid, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam only ever uh, lived in one of the two. Uh, and that was Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha's house. Uh, the reason for that was that at the time, Sauda radiallahu ta'ala anha, she was quite elderly. She was around 50 to 55 years of age. Uh, so she was slightly older than the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as well. See, after the death of Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha, Khawla bint Hakim, she came, up, she came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And she told the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam about Sauda, who would be a good companion for the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, because she knew the Prophet was upset after losing, Khadi losing Khadija. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam children. So she knew the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam needed somebody else for support. So she told the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam about Sauda radiallahu ta'ala anha. So what happened was that, you see Sauda radiallahu ta'ala anha, she, she was one of those where she and her husband had migrated to Abyssinia. So they were amongst the early, uh, earlier Muslims and they had migrated to Abyssinia. Right? It was sometime later, her husband passed away. Now, if she had returned to Mecca as a widow, her family would have forced her to turn back to paganism, right? towards idol, uh, idol worshipping. And they would have persecuted her for embracing Islam. Right? And at the time, the Prophet's intention was to only marry if a suitable woman came along, because the Prophet obviously, as mentioned, had young children who no longer had that care of a mother, right? So these two reasons. Now, what happens, uh, uh, what happens next, inshallah, will continue after this very short break. Assalamu alaikum, welcome back after that very short break. So just before the break, we were just mentioning regarding Sauda radiallahu ta'ala anha, that she had migrated to Abyssinia, her husband had passed away, and if she had returned to Makkah al Mukarramah, then what would have happened was she would have been persecuted and forced to turn back uh, to paganism and idol worshipping. And, on to, uh, and, and then, as well as that, the Prophet sallallahu had young children, so the Prophet wanted to choose the ideal individual who, who could uh, give that uh, motherly affection to his children. So realizing Sauda uh, radiallahu ta'ala anha's helplessness and her situation, he decided, the Prophet decided to marry her so that he could be a support for her and she could be a support for him and his children. Right? But she wasn't just a caretaker or a babysitter for the Prophet and children. Yes, you know, she was indeed a warm and nurturing caregiver to his family. But she was actually so much more than that to him and our Ummah, subhanAllah, right? So anyways, because Sauda radiallahu ta'ala anha, she was quite elderly. And now that Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha was also married to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Sauda radiallahu ta'ala anha, she wanted to please the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, right? Uh, so she told the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that, look, O Prophet of Allah, I'm an elderly lady, right? And I know that you prefer the company of Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha. So I will allow you to stay permanently with her. So for that reason, the Prophet sallallahu used to stay in Aisha's house, but he would still spend time with Sauda radiallahu ta'ala anha during the day. So, her, so the Prophet's main house, and the only house he would actually spend the nights, was the house of Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha.
Now, you see when the five salah were made compulsory during the night of Mi'raj, except for the three rakats of Maghrib, the remaining four salah, i.e. Fajr, Dhuhr, Asr, and Aisha, they were actually only two rakats, right? As we know it today, uh, Zuhr, uh, Asr, and Aisha are four rakats, right? But at the time when it was made compulsory, Maghrib was three, and the remaining four salah were only two rakats, right? It was only after the migration to Medina that a further two rakats were added to Dhuhr, Asr, and Aisha, making them four rakats each, right? Uh, that how we have it today. Now, whenever the time for salah would come in, the people, what they would do, is they would just assemble in the masjid without any sort of notice. They'll just look at the time, uh, right, I think it's salah time, let's go to the masjid, right? So the Prophet sallallahu at the time felt that there should be some sort of signal that would make it easier for people to know that it's time for salah and then gather in the masjid. So what the Prophet did was he gathered all the sahaba. He called all the sahaba and he consulted them. Right? What should we do? How should we call the people at the time of salah? What should we use? What should be our sign? Right? What, what can we use where, where as we use it, the, Prophet, uh, the people would know that it's time for salah and we should start making our way to the masjid. Right? So one companion said, quite very easy. Why don't we just use a bell like the Christians do? Right? The churches, they have bells. Let's put a bell as well. So when we, when we strike a bell, it means it's salah time. If the Christians do it, it's, it's their worship. But, you know, we can use a bell. Easy. But this wasn't accepted. It was discarded to avoid resemblance with the non-Muslims. Right? And secondly, the Prophet actually didn't like bells. Right? Um, then another individual said, okay, let's do this then. Let's use a horn instead. Right? You don't want to use a bell. Let's use a horn. We'll blow a horn. But again, that was rejected as well because that was, again, uh, uh, being used by one of the other uh, one of the other religions or sects. Then someone suggested lighting a fire on a platform higher. So whenever it's salah time, let's light a fire. People would see the smoke and the fire and they know it's time for salah. Right? Now this resembled the fire worshippers. So that idea was rejected as well. So these ideas are coming in, but they're all either somebody's already doing it and it's resembling somebody and somebody else or it's something which just isn't suitable so what happened was the gathering it ended without any concrete resolution so the, there was no decision made but subhanallah allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had already chosen the perfect signal so what happens is that very night, one of the companions by the name of Abdullah ibn Zayd, he saw a dream. In the dream, he saw a man walking past him holding a bell. So in the dream, Abdullah ibn Zayd, he says that I came and I, I stopped the man that was walking past and asked him, can, he asked the individual, can, can I buy this bell? The man said, why? Why do you want my bell for? So he replied, because... The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam wants to call the people to prayer. So I'm thinking this bell would probably do the job. So remember, he, he's seeing all this in the dream. This is his dream that he's narrating. He's having this conversation with this individual. So he's asked, he's told the, in, this individual the reason why he wants to buy his bell in the dream. So on that, the man in the dream said to him that, okay, if that's the case, shall I not tell you something better than the bell? Something else you can use. So Abdullah ibn Zayd radiallahu ta'ala, he, he said to the man, of course, please tell me what, what, what's better. So the man, he said, when you want to call the people to prayer, say, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Ashadu Allah ilaha illallah, Ashadu Allah ilaha illallah, all the way to the end. Basically, he, he said in the dream, he said the entire Adhan as we know it today to Abdullah ibn Zayd. This dream ended and Abdullah ibn Zayd wakes up in the morning. Now this dream was so vivid 
that the next morning he rushed to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam to tell him. Right? He wasted no time whatsoever. He woke as soon as his eyes opened. Wow! I need to tell the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam this dream that I've had. So he's gone rushing to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and he's narrated the entire incident to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. After hearing the dream of Abdullah ibn Zaid, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, "Subhanallah, this is a true dream, inshallah." Bear in mind that inshallah, we usually say, when we say, you know, if Allah wills, bear in mind that the inshallah that the Prophet said here, it wasn't because the Prophet was unsure or, or, or as an expression of uncertainty. Here the Prophet used inshallah more as a form of barakah and blessings. Otherwise the Prophet knew that this was a true dream and the Prophet said so. So then the Prophet then said, he, he's heard this dream, told the people, this is the right dream, this is what we need to do. The Prophet said, now somebody needs to give the adhan, somebody needs to, get, needs, to, needs to perform this signal. So the Prophet said, then called Bilal radiallahu ta'ala anhu and said, stand up, O Bilal. Stand up, O Bilal, because you have the loudest voice. In fact, narrations actually mention that Bilal radiallahu ta'ala anhu was gifted with a deep, melodious, resonant and vibrant voice, right? So he was chosen to be the individual to call the first ever Adhan. And you see, through this, the Prophet ﷺ also taught the people about racial equality and racial justice. Because remember that at the time then, slaves had no rights. Those with the darkest skin color were looked at as inferior. Right? And it was during that time the Prophet ﷺ chose a former slave who was darker in complexion than the Arabs to have the honor to be the first to perform the call to prayer, to perform the adhan. And in fact, the narrations mention, that, or the, or the, the scholars write, that Bilal ta'ala anhu is the chief of all the mu'addineen, i.e. the chief of all those who perform the call to prayer. In fact, uh, regarding this uh, Dr. Craig of Rice University in Texas, he actually says that the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was the first person in human history to declare in no uncertain terms that no person is above another by virtue of race or ethnicity. SubhanAllah. So Bilal Radiyadu who was chosen for this honorable task, the Prophet Sallallahu then told Abdullah Ibn Zaid to stand with Bilal radiallahu ta'ala anhu and teach him the adhan. So Abdullah ibn Zayd told him every phrase and Bilal repeated in a loud and beautiful voice. For the very first time, the people are hearing the adhan being called. Right? So the people, they start to make their way to the masjid to see what's going on. Now, uh, now Umar radiallahu ta'ala he hears the words uh, and he comes running to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa right? Narrations mention that he hadn't even fully tied his lower garment. So he's literally still dressing himself as he's rushing, right? So he comes before the Prophet Sallallahu and says, O Messenger of Allah, I swear by Allah that I have also heard these words in my dream, right? Because it so happened that Umar radiallahu ta'ala also had the very same dream that Abdullah ibn Zayd had. So Allah had shown this to multiple Sahaba, but it was Abdullah ibn Zayd who was given the honor of narrating it to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So you see, although in Islam, a person can sometimes be shown certain things in a dream. However, we cannot base our Sharia on them. The only exception to this is the dreams of the prophets, which are divine. So this Adhan, although it seems that it's been legislated by the dream of a Sahabi, that's not actually the case. It's actually because the Prophet Sallallahu said, this is a true dream. Allah wanted it to happen like this. And that's the reason why the Adhan, uh, you know, it came into being like this. You see, one thing that's amazing about the Adhan is that the configuration and sequence of the words is actually remarkable. It, you know, sometimes we don't actually ponder over the Adhan uh, as much as we should, right? Because there's the, the entire Adhan, it's only one to one and a half, two minutes, only a few words. But subhanAllah, the configuration and the sequence of the words is actually remarkable. How, inshallah, we'll, uh, we'll mention uh, next week in the next episode. And uh, 
this brings us to the end of today. So before we leave, once again, a couple of questions for our viewers from today from today's session. First question is the houses of which two wives of the Prophet were attached to the masjid? And the second question, which two companions saw the Adhan in their dream? And the third question is which Sahabi was chosen to call out the Adhan? So if you know the answer, then please do messages on WhatsApp on the number that's on your screen. Similarly, if you have any other questions or comments uh, for us on this topic of Sira, then please do messages on the same number. Uh, inshallah, we hope to see you again next week. Until then, stay safe. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Assalamu alaikum ya Rasulullah, Habib Allah.